A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court The Tale of the Lost Land Chapter 1 Camelot Camelot? Camelot, said I to myself. I don't seem to remember hearing of it before. Name of the asylum, likely. It was a soft, reposeful summer of landscape, as lovely as a dream and as lonesome as Sunday. The air was full of the smell of flowers and the buzzing of insects and the twittering of birds, and there were no people, no wagons, there was no stir of life, nothing going on. The road was mainly a winding path with hoof prints in it, and now and then a faint trace of wheels on either side in the grass, wheels that apparently had a tire as broad as one's hand. Presently a fair slip of a girl, about ten years old, with a cataract of golden hair, streaming down over her shoulders, came along. Around her head she wore a hoop of lame red posies. It was as sweet in outfit as I ever I saw what there was of it. She walked indolently along, with a mind at rest, its peace reflected in her innocent face. The circus man paid no attention to her, didn't even seem to see her, and she, she was no more startled at his fantastic makeup than if she was used to his like every day of her life. She was going by as indifferently as she might have gone by a couple of cows, but when she happened to notice me, then there was a change. Up went her hands, and she was turned to stone. Her mouth dropped open, her eyes stared wide and timorously. She was the picture of astonished curiosity touched with fear. And there she stood gazing in a sort of stupefied fascination till we turned a corner of the wood and were lost to her view. That she should be startled at me instead of at the other man was too many for me. I couldn't make head or tail of it. And that, and that she should be seen to consider me a spectacle and totally overlook her own merits in that respect was another puzzling thing and a display of magnanimity, too. It was surprising in one so young. There was food for thought to hear. I moved along as one in a dream. As we approached the town, sounds of life began to appear. At intervals we passed a wretched cabin with a thatched roof and about it small fields and garden patches and an indifferent state of cultivation. There were people, too, brawny men with long, coarse, uncombed hair that hung down over their faces and made them look like animals. They and the woman, as a rule, wore a torse toe linen robe that came well below the knee and a rude sort of sandal, and many wore an iron collar. The small boys and girls were always naked, but nobody seemed to know it. All of these people stared at me, talked about me, ran into the huts and fetched out their families to gape at me. But nobody ever can notice that other fellow, except to make him humble salutation and get no response for their pains. In the town were some substantial windowless houses of stone scattered among a wilderness of thatched cabins. The streets were more ear crooked alleys and unpaved. Troops of dogs and nude children played in the sun and made life a noise. Hogs roamed and rooted contentedly about, and one of them lay in a reeking wallow in the middle of the main thoroughfare and suckled her family. Presently there was a distant blare of military music. ta -ra! It came nearer, still nearer, and soon a noble cavalcade roamed into view. Glorious with plumed helmets and flashing mail and flaunting banners and rich doublets and horse claws and gilded spearheads, and through the muck and swine and naked brats and joyous dogs and shabby huts it took its gallant way, and in its wake we followed. Followed through one winding alley and then another, and climbing, always climbing, till at last we gained the breezy height where the huge castle stood. There was an exchange of bugle blasts, Tora, Tora, then a parley from the walls where men at arms and Halberg and Morion marched back and forth with Halberg at shoulder under flapping banners with the rude figure of a dragon displayed upon them. And then the great vates were flung open, the drawbridge was lowered, and the head of the cavalcade swept forward under the frowning arches. And we, following, soon found ourselves in a great paved court with towers and turrets stretching up under the blue air all on all four sides. And all about us the dismount was going on, and much greeting and ceremony, and running to and fro on a gay display of moving and intermingling colors, and an altogether pleasant stir and noise and confusion. End of chapter 1. Camelot.